When we think of magical arts, we often think of arcane practices, tangible and intangible acts as part of some ritual. We might even see these two events, the act and the desired result, as unrelated, and most magic supposes a direct correlation between the two behind some immaterial veil. On the other hand, we always see time and again that common psychological explanation for why magic works, the shifting and impressing of one subconscious. The problem is that all too often we see it as an explanation only, rather than a space for exploration. Today, under the scope of changing cognitive behavior and asking you to alter your daily arts just a bit, we will explore reality a little further. We will address mindfulness in reality, its path to mastery, and relate it back to the common occult habits. Of course, I also present this not only as education, but as a call to action. I'm asking you to try it. With all that being said, my name is River, and welcome to the Nimiton. I'm going to begin by saying that some of this subject has been very lightly discussed in the Batul Hayesh video. Yet there I said you can change your thoughts by changing habits without much context. While today, we will be lightly utilizing psychology's actual system of changing thought patterns. It's known comfortably as Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT. Now it is my duty to tell you that I am not a licensed CBT therapist. I was simply self-educated, through books, using CBT to alter psychological disorders. My only claim is that I have an earnest interest, personal experience, and success with the methods which were used for the sake of my own well-being. In esoteric studies, we will always find our way back around to the will of oneself. Yet too many read of the will and never get to fully realize its existence. They don't get to only have their force of will to rely on, therefore they become less comfortable with it. Paradoxically, one of the best ways to get in tune with the usage of one's own will is through engagement with our environment, drawing distinctions, and allowing our brains to digest the information around it more readily. Discovering the will is humanizing and elevating because it reduces the animalistic inclinations. It takes attention from the lower faculties and reallocates it to the higher, thereby empowering those higher faculties. These faculties, as I've called them, are common to all mysticism and metaphysics. They are will, mind, emotions, and body. You may at first glance say the will, mind, emotions, and body are all localized in the mind, are they not? While clearly they are, we distinguish the will because it conquers the mind. The mind controls the individual's inclinations called emotions. The emotions direct the desires of the body. And of course, each is intricately related to each other in a variety of ways to the point that breaking it all down would be a needless task. But if you end up having a question about it, feel free to ask me in the comments. So let's get one thing straight. We're going to have to presuppose that you have a will and I assure you through experience that you absolutely do. But what is it? Will is like a greater decision maker, beyond impulse, beyond simple matters. It does desire, however, and is almost synonymous with the concept of expressing desire. For clarity, its significance, the will, is the first metaphysical revelation in the Kabbalah. The very first words of the Zohar read, when the king desired. And why did he desire? Often we do not know the root of true desire. We know the source of desires of the mind, and of the heart, and of the body. But at some level we can only wonder as it reaches a point of inconclusion. This higher faculty is the full agent and operator for the practices we're going to discuss. Now that we've covered the basics of will, we will learn how to use it in the thought altering practices of CBT. I will only be providing a single method, called herein the chain of thoughts, which comes from the cognitive method of changing belief patterns. 
This will allow us to take thoughts and put them to battle against each other on the path of self-discovery. The general philosophy is that the thoughts that rush into your mind are closer to your subconscious beliefs. So we will be using your logical faculties to dissect them, to bring them to light, and understand your worldview. I suggest you learn it well, as it will be used as the core component in everything discussed later. When we're engaging with life, our mind is consistently feeding us random thoughts, even thoughts we are unaware of from the subconscious spaces. General contemplation doesn't really need CBT, yet the response thoughts are perfect candidates, and we'll explain more on that later. For now, let's suppose you have a thought. Maybe it comes about randomly. Maybe it's in response to some stimuli. Maybe it's about an interaction. Or maybe it's better categorized by a feeling. Write it down. For example, let's go to a generally negative response. Let's say I wrote out, I'm angry because my friend has stupid opinions. Now we're going to expand downward. We're going to begin making the chain. Why are you angry? What really went on? I'm feeling angry because my friend seems illogical. Their views are wrong. And then we will add another link to this chain. I'm feeling anger because my friend didn't validate my views, yet they're logically wrong. And a final time. I'm allowing myself to feel anger because I value my friend's opinion and now they've disrupted my image of them. You can see the degradation in thought process changes. I'm angry shifts to I'm feeling angry, to I'm feeling anger, to I'm allowing myself to feel anger. For those who have experience in CBT, you may wonder why I'm not pursuing self-defeating beliefs like hopelessness or perfectionism. And that is because I'm not addressing psychological issues in this video. I'm just giving an overview on how this can apply in a general sense. Of course, these practices must go beyond the negative responses, though. We should also analyze positive reactions. When something occurs that makes us feel good, we should pause to question what about it really made us feel good. In the same way, we would use the chain of thoughts. If I were to write out, I love my home, we can expand that extensively. Ask yourself questions like, is love the best word to describe my emotion? What is it that I love about my home? Work your way down to the bottom, and most of the time, you'll likely come down to comfort and security. So you may be asking yourself, how does this change my thoughts at all? All you're asking me to do is describe them thoroughly, and that my dear viewer is exactly the point. I want you to become so in tune with your psyche that it is second nature to not only run through that chain of thoughts, but to know how it ends thereby making the ending realization your normal mind frame. It can become your subconscious faculty's go-to belief, rather than the more primal and common one we began with of I feel angry or I love my home. You can instinctively see your thoughts lifted and brought to light through your own self-will and practice. So you may have not noticed, but in this practice, we're actually addressing both the psyche and the emotions as the logical and subconscious faculty of the mind. We're distinguishing them as they're often fused there. So there's really no need for a specific portion on emotions as a whole, but we need not forget the body. Now that we've gotten the foundational working of thought analysis out of the way, how will these practices be applied? Not only to how you respond to things, but in how you interact and engage with things. For that, we have to turn to the only five engagements of the human body, the senses. For those that are curious, sensory engagement, such as taking note of five things you can see, four things you can touch, three you hear, two smell, and one thing you might taste, is a method of removing someone from acute anxiety states, as well as grounding them back into reality during derealizations. However, we won't be approaching this so simply. We're going to take it a few steps further into something you can do throughout the day. We begin with a sense you use all the time with little regard. Hearing. As this sense is integral to focus and spatial awareness beyond our eyes. 
I'm going to pull this from an expert on the acts and importance of hearing, specifically listening. And for that, I go to Julian Treasure. His suggestions will be the basis of sensory awareness in this discussion. These practices are threefold. When listening to a conglomerate of sounds, such as a lot of sounds going on simultaneously, focus on a single one. Take note of details relative to where it is. What is making it? What are your thoughts on it? And then select another amidst the group of noises. The second is when engaging with sound, make conscious decisions to actively or passively listen rather than it being dictated by your impressions and emotional sway. Focus on others or don't. Always be making the decision instead of being directed from lower inclinations. The third, engage in silence for brief periods every day. Those that meditate should have no issues with this one, but it is integral for setting up a comfortable place to work from. With those practices covered, just imagine how in tune with the audible stimuli of the world you could be. In fact, now let's take those sounds and consider if you have any responsive thoughts to them. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Apply the chain, break them down, understand them, and better understand yourself. Unfortunately, with sound covered, we can steamroll through the other four, as we already have a solid foundation. When you look, when you touch, when you smell, when you taste, what are you really getting out of it? Break it down, become intimate with the experience. Catch your responses and break down your psychology that you might have an even deeper understanding. Pay attention to what your eyes are drawn to. What grabbed your attention so readily? How do things feel when you touch them? Think like an overly expressive author and recount to your greatest ability the sensations. When you smell, don't simply label it as, this smells like a rose. Recount the emotional aspects of the experience. How does that smell relate to your immediate moment? Where were you? What were you doing? How did you feel before and after smelling it? Can you remember the smell even a day later? It does have the most portion of the brain dedicated to memory. And I know these seem so trivial to many of us. But the ability to gain full hold over your senses is immense. And the control of sensations and a greater understanding of them supports your dominion over your own body. It is will empowerment to its fullest extent. It also lessens personal reactivity. which we may already know that reactiveness is unbecoming in the expression of some magical arts. Rather, we need to be headstrong with enduring fortitude. What I genuinely want you to experience, though, is something I'll call selective reactivity. The ability to express emotion openly when the time is most beneficial rather than when you are prodded to do so based on personal inclinations. Impulses and lower expressions are all the signs of a lack of control. It shows wavering wills, or one that is slightly out of touch with its owner. And even to be mundane, even know how many purchases are made purely off of impulse rather than a conscious decision, it's quite a lot. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the educational portion now we're going to briefly cover the challenge idea behind this video, the call to action that I'm extending to you. Don't take these acts as simple mannerisms, but grab a notebook and over the course of 21 days make a conscious effort to try and engage with life more this way. Take the notes suggested on your senses, break down your thoughts and responses through the chain of thoughts, take the time to detail what you can without getting in the way of your life and watch as these practices become second nature. You stop taking notes. You stop thinking about it. Because now the subconscious aspect of the mind is comfortable with the practice and performs it of its own accord. Your natural thoughts will change. You will be less reactive, less wavering. And this I can by the studies of many psychologists, along with the conquering of my own issues through these methods, guarantee to you.
Good luck. And don't be afraid to share if it assists you in any way in your general magical dealings that you were doing prior to the challenge. As always, a massive thank you to my many friends, patrons, and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know.